Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Harris, uh, founding director of the Real Change newspaper, which has been around for 25 years. And he's been advocating for the poor for over three decades. thinking about what I was going to talk about tonight, probably more than I needed to, because I always sort of like evolve into my kind of graphs that I have down. But there's some stuff that has been going on lately that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the Seattle State of Homeless Emergency and what that's looked like on the ground. and. Um, profoundly wrong-headed, <laughs> and I want to talk about the uh, new report that has come out, because I've been kind of immersed in it, I think it's interesting, the city auditor is looking at the sweeps in Seattle, and the second quarterly report has come out, I think it's a really great read, it has a really, really boring title to it, something like Second Quarter Report on blah, 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 you know, it's, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think it's worth reading, and it's like really bureaucratic, but it's really a pretty great critique, um, and the first report is worth reading as well, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. You know, what I'm going to focus on, the through line to what I'm going to be talking about, is how dehumanizing homelessness is, and how our policies that we have around homelessness often don't recognize that, and go wrong at that point of human dignity, and how we treat people, and how we recognize people's need for agency and community and human dignity and the sorts of things that we all take for granted. But uh, when somebody is street homeless, for some reason policymakers don't assume that they have those same needs that the rest of us do for to, to value themselves and, and live in community and hang on to their dignity. Um, so I'm going to talk about about that. That's kind of going to be my main theme tonight. I should press start on my little phone timer. Not that I have a limit, but I can go on, and if I've gone on for too long, this little thing will... Shit! <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> um, so, my first involvement with homelessness was when I was a college student back in 1986. I'm 58 now, and I get my decades jumbled. Um, so this was in 1986. I grew up poor. Um, I was a runaway at 17. I went to college by way of the Air Force. In 10th grade, I got kicked out of all three high schools in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which, you know, is sort of my banner achievement. Um, I was a chronic truant by 8th grade. I didn't get diagnosed with ADD until I was 48. That explained a lot when that happened. Um, and, you know, I was a, I was a teenage stoner. Um, found my way to the joys of speed and meth. By the time I went into the Air Force ostensibly to get sober in 79, I had hair down to here, all frizzed out, and I weighed 130 pounds. 
I weigh like 190 pounds now, so that gives you an idea. I was sort of like this human mop. Um, uh, and, you know, when I went into the Air Force, I, I, I didn't achieve my goals of going sober. I just found a sort of a higher class of stoner to hang out with. And it, it happened for me, really, when I, well, toward the end of my time in the Air Force, I went straight. Um, I would, probably would have gotten kicked out if I didn't. There was a lot of motivation. They were definitely on to me. Um, and I had, I had what I talk about as my, my Iceman cometh moment, because I had enrolled in community college. I got a GED to go into the Air Force, and I enrolled in community college while I was in the Air Force, and I was taking uh, classes, and they had us read Eugene and Neil's Iceman Cometh. And Iceman Cometh all takes place in this bar in Harry Hope's saloon. And the thing that um, the characters in it, the thing that they all have in common, um, other than that they all got some sort of like dignity saving pipe dream that they say they're going to do. Some guy's going to go and start his business, another guy's going to like run for mayor, or, you know, get back into politics. And they all like try to achieve their pipe dreams and, and kind of fail and come back with their tails up between their legs. And, and, and then in the end, the guy that challenges them all to do that is revealed that he murdered his wife, so that gives them what they need to just kind of go back to business as usual and forget the whole thing ever happened. But the thing that they all have in common with each other is this sort of willingness to believe that being drunk all the time and being, you know, hanging out together in this bar and that being their entire life is normal. And, you know, I saw myself in that. I was like, holy shit, I'm in locked in Harry Hope's saloon. And all of my friends are a bunch of stoners and alcoholics, and that's what we have in common. And I want more for myself than that. So I wound up going to college. So it was a long walk to, well, first of all, the significance of that is that you know, for me, I don't see a whole lot of difference between myself and somebody who is homeless on the street because I recognize that I might not have had that epiphany. I might not have been born white and tall, you know. I, you know, I was a smart kid, you know. I, like, aced the sort of standardized tests all the way through grade school. Grade school. I couldn't get grades because I was ADD as fuck. But, but, you know, I was a smart kid. I had that going for me. Um, and a lot of luck. I never got arrested, you know. I never got arrested. I never picked up a criminal record, you know. So things like that, you know. But I, I realized that, I, and I realized since then, that, you know, what separates me from people on the street is, you know, a lot of luck and some privilege. And that... Um, fundamentally, you know, I could have wound up where they're at, and, and you know, it's, it's what separates us is a lot thinner than, than a lot of us believe. Um, so, my first involvement with homelessness in 1986, we established that. I'm going to UMass Amherst, I'm enmeshed in the Radical Student Union, I'm a student activist, I basically majored in student activism. Um, and I started my first paper when I was at UMass, this like monthly anarchist rag called Critical Times, and that was how I learned how to do newspapers. And me and my radical cohorts all got into a van and drove to Washington, D.C. to support a fast by this guy named Mitch Snyder. And a lot of people now don't know who Mitch Snyder was, and they think that that is a shameful fact. How many people know who Mitch Snyder is? Nobody? Holy shit, <laughs> sad. Well, Mitch Snyder, and sort of the advent of mass homelessness, there was a movie made about this guy, it's called The Samaritan, Martin Sheen played him. Um, and 
uh, he was a national level advocate for the homeless um, during the period when mass homelessness was just starting to get off the ground during the 80s when the numbers of shelter beds in American cities were tripling and quadrupling after the sort of Reagan cutbacks and the deinstitutionalization and deindustrialization changed the shape of the economy where mass homelessness began to be just part of a structural part of our economy. And he had his finger on that. And he was connected with this group called the Community for Creative Nonviolence. And they were doing housing takeovers. They were doing building takeovers. They had this national movement um, where other people were doing housing takeovers. They were organizing homeless people to be leaders in this fight because they had the value that homeless people most affected needed to be speaking for themselves. Um, so this guy was on a 51-day fast. They were opening their big shelter in Washington, D.C., the building that they committed to them. They didn't have any money to operate it. They were trying to beat some money out of, it, out of the city to, so that they could run the shelter. And one of his signature tactics was the fast. And he did a 51-day fast where he almost died. He lost 57 pounds. And he was in a wheelchair and, you know, frail. And the city caved, gave him the money. And I went there as part of this big protest to support the fast. There were hundreds of people that were protesting. 75 people got arrested. I got arrested. It was my first civil disobedience. Spent three days in D.C. Central Cell Block. Um, and a reporter asked him um, whether he was afraid to die. And he said, no, it's painful, but I have a greater fear of allowing people to languish like animals, and sometimes I'm afraid that I'm not doing enough. And that really hit hard for me. I mean, that stuck with me all of these years, that sort of sense of urgency. and and the recognition of the dehumanization that is in there, you know? And this is like one of the things that, you know, first I was going to talk about, about real change. I'll talk about real change before I kind of go more into the dehumanization thing. So real change, um, it's a street newspaper. How many people buy real change? Pretty good. More of you than know Mitch Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough of you. You all need to be buying Real Change. Real Change is a street newspaper. Um, it's the second street newspaper I founded. I started another one in Boston in 1992. And I was working organizing homeless people, and because I have limited time, and I've already done this 10-minute digression, um, I won't go into how I got into that, but I was organizing homeless people in Boston. And that's what I did after I graduated from, from college. And I was still influenced by Mitch, Mitch Snyder, the sort of mentors in Boston, kind of this Northeast area lieutenants, a couple of ministers in, in Boston. And I had been organizing homeless people for, well, I started, I started in like 87, 88 when I started organizing homeless people, and I founded Spare Change in 92. And the reason I started Spare Change, the um, first paper in the modern street paper movement is considered to be street news in New York, started in the late 80s. That was the first paper in the United States that as a response to mass homelessness, you know, people would buy the paper up front for, you know, a fraction of the cover cost, and they would sell it on the street for a dollar, and they would get tips, and they would be able to earn money doing that. It took off like a rocket, you know. It was the right idea at the right time. A bunch of street papers, a handful of street papers, started in the early 90s, um, looking at that as an example. 
And as an organizer, it really spoke to me because I felt like what I was doing was I was just kind of going from one media hit to another. You know, we would organize at Penn City on the Boston Common. You know, we'd camp out at the federal building to test federal spending priorities. We'd like sit in at the state house to bring protest budget cuts. But it felt like just kind of one media hit after another that wasn't building institutional power. And the insight that I had was that, you know, I had this value that homeless people need to uh, be agents of their own liberation. You know, they, they, they we're talking about ending homelessness. You know, good God, we've got to have homeless people in there being part of the conversation and bringing their experience into it. But the horizon for economic justice organizing, social justice organizing, um, is very long and uncertain. You know, so we have a tent city at the base of the federal building in Seattle, and we do that for three days, and we get in the media. Is anybody who participated in that likely to get housing out of it? No. You know, so that's a problem. <laughs> and and homeless people's needs, well, that horizon for economic justice organizing is long and uncertain. Homeless people's needs are very immediate and dire. So the street paper idea was like, you know, it's like, wow, well, you know, people can be activists, people can be out there talking to people, building relationships across class, spreading good information about what's going on on the street. Um, and they can get paid to do that at the same time and meet their own immediate needs. Um, so it's just this idea that was, you know, for me, the right idea at the right time. So I started Spare Change in Boston as a homeless run, entirely homeless run newspaper. I was sort of in my radical Olinsky phase as an organizer of all power to the people. My, my uh, sort of self-appointed director of the project was a stone sociopath. I had crack addicts who had access to the bank account. It was a fucking mess. Um, so it took like about a year for that to more or less kind of implode. That was the third time a homeless empowerment project imploded on me. And I was like, okay, something is wrong with this basic theory that I've been pursuing. So I decided to start over again with another street paper in another city, moved here to Seattle, um, moved here in March, had the first issue on the street by August 20th. Um, and it was just bootstrappy as, as hell. I was used to living poor, so I didn't mind not getting paid. Um, and uh, you know, the idea behind real change is that people, well now it costs $2, so people buy the papers for 60 cents each up front, they sell them for $2 plus tips, they're able to earn an income doing that. Um, at this point, we're a pretty big organization, we have like 15 staff people, budget of over a million dollars, we've got our, our offices on the corner of First and Main and Pioneer Square, I don't know how the hell that ever <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, we're a weekly newspaper. We have a professional journalist staff. Ansel Hertz is a new editor um, who used to be a reporter at Stranger. It's kind of a big deal. We're really happy to have him. But we have over 50 years of uh, professional news experience in our newsroom. Um, we win first place awards for journalism in the Society of Professional Journalists on a regular basis. People have this sort of notion of what street papers are. Um, that, you know, people's assumption about a street paper is, well, a street paper is written by homeless people for homeless people, so therefore it's kind of, a, what I'm going to find in there is, you know, some bad poetry, um, some writing by homeless people that is probably full of heart but not very good and some advocacy articles that I would care about if I were a better person. So therefore the only reason I would buy this is to hand somebody a couple of bucks because it's not hand handling and, and hand handling makes me feel weird. Um, 
But that's not us. We're actually a really, really good newspaper. So I want you all to go out and buy it, get to know the vendor. Um, we also, I mean, we involve, we're very much a cross-class organization. That was sort of my insight on moving to Seattle, that to accomplish that kind of contradiction of um, building an institution that gets power for people who are by definition transient, that you need to be a cross-class organization, that everybody needs to bring their skills and their resources to the table, enable homeless folks to speak for themselves, um, involve them in the organization in multiple ways. We've got all kinds of ways for people to get involved beyond just selling the newspaper. Uh, we have an advocacy project that, that has had some pretty significant events that I won't go into because we have limited time to talk. Um, the thing that I have... <laughs> the thing that I've come to understand over the years I've been doing this, you know, if you would have asked me, even five years after I started Real Change, what is Real Change fundamentally about? I would have said that, you know, we're a low threshold employment project where people who don't have a lot of work experience or difficult work experience and, you know, uh, barriers to regular employment can find work. And we're a platform for doing community organizing. And we are that. But that's not the most important thing that we do. Real change is this hub of relationship. And that's where the transformation is. That's where the real kind of magic happens with our vendors. Um, and the person who really kind of woke me up to that fact, and this is still in the early years. This was about five years in. I was doing a uh, vendor of the month interview with this guy named Richard Smith. And when Richard was, when he started the paper, um, he was a heroin addict. Um, he was this little thin guy, stuttered, pretty profound stutter. Um, really shy, kind of like drawn in on himself. Um, very isolated in his life. Um, and over the time he sold the paper, um, I saw this thing happen, and I've seen it so many times since then, when people find themselves surrounded by, in, in, with relationship, and that changes how they view themselves, and it changes how they see their prospects in the world. They move from isolation to community. And, you know, he said, I used to hate people. I just used to hate people. I've been kicked around my whole life. I had no use for people at all. And I started selling the paper, and I found that people cared about me. You know, they would like, they would buy me cups of coffee, give me Christmas presents, they would talk to me like I was a regular person, you know? They, they treated him like a person. And that experience of being treated like a person, for the first time in a really long, long time for him, opened him up. He got off drugs, his stutter went away. This was like amazing. His stutter went away. You know, he started standing up taller, he would look people in the eye when he talked to them. He just like transformed as a human being. And that was, you know, seeing that and having him like kind of hit me over the head with the obvious, you know, that was my turning point where I went, mean, this is what this is all about. This is about relationships, it's about human dignity. Which brings me back to dehumanization, you know? Homelessness is profoundly dehumanizing, you know? Everybody treats you like you're a piece of shit. And, and you internalize that. You internalize that over time. You start to believe that you're a piece of crap. You start to believe that you are completely undeserving. 
that you deserve your isolation, that you have, why the hell shouldn't you be bummed out all the time on meth or crack or whatever the hell it is you're doing because you've got no prospects anyway, nobody gives a crap about you, all you see anywhere are dead ends, you know, why not opt for oblivion? You know, it's, 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 it's a crazy choice and it's a rational choice, you know? And, and what I've seen real change do over and over again is people have experienced that community and have been embraced by the community and treated like a person. Their notion of who they are shifts. And the sorts of behaviors that are self-defeating that were adaptive for them at one point are no longer adaptive for them and they come to realize that they're not that person anymore and they put down those behaviors and they grow. And that's, that's, that's where the magic is. There's this study that I always like to talk about. It was done at Yale um, and it was reported in the Magazine for Social Innovation, and forgetting the right title of it. But it was this study that was done with MRI imaging. Um, and it looked at, what they did was they hooked people up to the MRI thing, so they had to watch pieces of the brain light up as they looked at pictures. And they showed people pictures of high status and low status people. And when they showed those pictures, there was this part of the brain that lit up, that recognized that this is a human being, because this part of the brain lights up, you know, I don't know, the, like brain science, I couldn't tell you, you know, so, what, what part of the brain it was, but, you know, it like recognizes, you know, that low status person is a human being, that high status person is a human being, had that in common. They showed people pictures of um, people who were homeless and people who were drug addicts. And in a lot of cases, that part of the brain did not light up that recognizes them as a human being. The part of the brain that lit up was the part of the brain that was associated with the emotion of disgust same part of the brain that lights up when you show people piles of trash and overflowing toilets and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's, it, and when what they found, the sort of like, you know, hopeful piece of this information is that they found that this isn't necessarily hardwired, that they could change that perception. And what changes that perception is proximity. The more proximity people have to homeless people, drug users, the more likely they are to see them as a human being. And they can actually like make that shift where before, you know, they didn't view them as human beings, that part of their brain didn't light up, you know, they, that's, that's changeable, it's malleable. Um, and I think that any of us in this room who thinks that they are above that are kidding yourselves, you know? I mean, even me, you know? I have a piece of me that others homeless people and sees them as something, you know, I mean, I don't always do this, but, you know, I definitely have my moments, you know? I think it's kind of like being, being white and being white, like being white in America. If you're white in America, you can't help but be a racist. If you like say you're not a racist, you're full of shit. It's the water that we swim in, you know, we're, we're racist, you know? And I think it's kind of that same phenomenon, you know? We see these dehumanizing images of homelessness, the way that people are, are treated, the way they're regarded in public policy. That gets internalized. We can't help it. We need to be on guard around it. We need to be aware of it. Just, you know, like we need to be aware of our racism. I think it's part of our just sort of internal mindset. And, you know, obviously there's degrees. But I think that it, it influences public policy. 
you know, because I think that our public policy often winds up being very dehumanizing and sees homeless folks through that lens as, as other, you know? I mean, there's a lot of pretense of including homeless people. Every once in a while, we'll do a survey. We'll always put the token person on the committee. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of ways that they solicit input, but they don't give a shit, you know? I mean, it's the people that have got all the degrees after their names that are making the policy and are up on, what floor is it, of the city building, is it the 46th floor of the city building that HSD is on? Um, or the seventh floor of City Hall, you know. I mean, from there, people people look different, and you know, if, if they tell you that they really give a shit what homeless people have to say, they're probably lying. <laughs> and and our policy reflects that. So I want to talk about about that a bit. Um, I want to talk about housing. The, sort of start with housing. You know, I mean, everybody, it's a given that housing is the solution to homelessness, right? It has like, ask nine out of 10 advocates, what's the solution to homelessness? <laughs> <laughs> housing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's reason for that. It's definitely one of the causes of homelessness. You know, for the last half dozen years, we've had the highest rising median income in the nation in Seattle. We've had the fastest rising rents in Seattle over the last half dozen years. We've seen average rents go up by like $550. I actually looked this up because I didn't want to be blathering false statistics. And in 2013, the median rent for uh, one bedroom apartment was 1575 bucks. Now it's 2125 That's a $550 increase in, in six years. Um, and there's this study that's often cited, it was in the Journal of Public Affairs, that for every $100 increase in rent on average, you'll probably see about a 15% increase in homelessness. And that has borne true in Seattle. I mean, we're seeing our rates of homelessness just go through the roof over the last half dozen years. And the reality is, is that, I mean, people say, oh, we're spending all this money on homelessness, it's not doing any good, blah, blah, blah. You know, what are they doing with that money? Well, the reality is, is that, you know, first of all, the human services agencies and the housing agencies aren't equipped to meet the need that is out there. They are not overfunded, they're underfunded, radically underfunded, and they are not able to keep up with the rate at which the rising cost of housing is creating economic vulnerability and dumping people out onto the street because they're just hanging on economically by their fingernails and they can't absorb another rent increase, you know? So that's, that's real. But here's where things get weird, is that, you know, when the policy position is what's the solution to homelessness? Housing, 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 you gotta build housing. That gets blind. That gets blind, and that has been a big problem in Seattle over the last, well, really the entire time I've been here, but in particularly, in particular, <laughs> unnecessarily to realize that. <laughs> Since they started, like, the 10-year plan approach to homelessness, you know, it was driven by the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, all the smart people with PhDs who were connected to power in Washington, and the housing, housing, housing approach um, has a darker logic to it, you know? I mean, look at, I'm, I'm going to just digress for a moment here. You know, I mean, when you look at, I'm blanking on it, help me, the latest solution du jour for getting people housing that replace Section 8s. 
Rapid rehousing? Rapid rehousing. Thank you. Ding, ding, ding. Rapid rehousing. I mean, look at it. I mean, rapid rehousing is a policy that basically takes public money, you know, I mean, they get their $900 or so, $900 to $1,000 in a rapid rehousing voucher. They can't get that in Seattle. They gotta go out of Seattle. So if you look at rapid rehousing, just from a sort of uh, move the homeless people of color the fuck out of Seattle to the south point of view, you know, I mean, we're accomplishing that because you can't get that kind of housing in Seattle. But the other thing is it is on the private market. You take those vouchers to the private landlord market. I am not naive enough to think that a housing policy that basically pours a subsidy into the private rental market by forcing people to go there with their housing vouchers did not originate in the darker recesses of Washington, D.C., where bankers and housing people uh, sort of, you know, have their slimy handshakes and, and, and develop policies. So, anyway. That was a digression. <laughs> um, but it goes back to, you know, the sort of 10-year plan approach to homelessness, housing, 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 how there's a sort of a, a corrupt logic to that, but also a blind logic to it. Because over the last two decades, one of the things that they have done, since the solution is housing, they have held the line on shelter. There's been this constant tension between funding housing and funding emergency shelter. You know, and there's been this sort of logic that, oh, we don't want to put money into shelter because shelter is part of the problem. Housing is the solution. Um, and there's been times when based on their projections of the housing that they're going to create, they wanted to cut back the shelter prematurely because they were so convinced that we were not going to need that shelter anymore. And we've had to fight them on that and get that shelter back because we knew damn well that we were going to need that shelter. And that line has always been there. And there's been that sort of tug of war and push and pull between funding housing and funding emergency shelter. And, and the devaluing of emergency shelter as a solution that meets people's needs. Beyond that, let's look at unsheltered homelessness, because unsheltered homelessness, those are the people who are not even in emergency shelter. Um, if they wanted to go to emergency shelter, they couldn't because the shelters are already full. But, you know, for a lot of them, that's okay because they've rejected shelter anyway, because shelter doesn't mean they meet their needs. Uh, you're infantilized when you go to emergency shelter. You're treated as less than human in a lot of circumstances. You've got these ridiculous curfews. You can't bring your stuff with you. If you bring your stuff with you, you have to like take it with you when you leave. You're leaving and you like have a curfew to be in by six or seven and kick you out at five in the morning. Who the hell wants to live like that? You're on a mat in the floor, there's bugs. You know, people who are PTSD, they can't deal with that. People who are couples, it doesn't work for them, they can't be together. People who've got pets, you know, like their sort of meaningful, meaningful relationship on the street is with their pet. You know, they separate them from their pets, they can't have that, they can't have, you know, belongings which they would be able to have in a tent encampment. So this is real. I mean, people reject shelter for legitimate reasons. But over the years, the relationship between, um, between the number of people who are in shelter and the people who are unsheltered has gotten progressively worse. We've been seeing like 19, 21% increases in the rate of unsheltered homelessness for like the last five years running. The last time we did the one night count, for the first time since I've been here, the number of unsheltered homeless people outnumbered 
people who were in emergency shelter. 52% of the people counted during the point in time one night count were unsheltered. Um, that's crazy. So our response to that has been to declare an emergency, state of emergency on homelessness. I'm seeing here that I've been yakking for 36 minutes. How long do I have? Uh, if you want to do like five more minutes and we can take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just take questions now. Okay, well there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to say, but I'll finish this thought. So, the unsheltered thing, what they're not doing right. Well, what they are doing right. I'll start with what they're doing right. What they're doing right is the city has been, just by the sheer magnitude of the crisis, I mean, they can't even pretend anymore <coughs> that they can in any way meet the needs of the people out there with the housing and the shelter that exist. So what has happened is really, I mean, I can't give all of the credit to the city because it's taken like 15 years of grassroots organizing to make this happen. Sanctioned encampments have been recognized as part of the continuum of care. It's like the missing bottom rung of the system that recognizes that people have a need for community. You ask any street homeless person what their relationship is to other people on the street, and they will say, we take care of each other. You know, that may or may not be true, truer in some cases than others, you know? I mean, it's a mixed bag, but, but because they prey on each other too. But people do take care of each other. There's a community, it's meaningful, um, and it's dignity enhancing, you know? They would rather, be engaged in those kinds of relationships with people that they can relate to um, and have their dignity and some semblance of, of freedom, um, then, then be part of this sort of dignity denying emergency shelter system that is not meeting their needs. And these sanctioned encampments and the tiny houses movement are a kind of a middle ground you know, it is a way for people who are street homeless to move out of more chaotic situations, drugier situations, places where there's more of a possibility of violence and things like that occurring, into a safer environment where they have their needs for community met they're part of a community. I mean, that's the thing about the sanctioned pandemic model and the tiny houses model is that people are part of it. I mean, they're, pick, they're pitching in and they're helping to do the work. You know, they're pulling security shifts. They're, they're, they're working the donations tent. You know, everybody's got a role and that's affirming. And it meets their needs for, for human dignity. Um, so that's, that's real and that's a big thing that the city has done that is really kind of revolutionary. I mean, no other city is doing this in the United States. Some cities are tolerating um, self-managed homeless encampments, but to have it as part of the city policy and to recognize it as a rung on a continuum of care, that's a huge, huge deal and Seattle is revolutionary about that. So here's what we're doing wrong. Here's what we're doing wrong with the Seattle State of Emergency. What we've done is we have gone into places where people used to camp that meet their, met their needs, you know? I mean, there was a reason that people camped in the jungle, you know? Like underneath that strip of I-5 and the Long Green Belt. There was a reason that people camped there. You had the overhead protection from the rain, it was relatively close to the downtown, methadone clinics were closed, Seattle, uh, human services access was closed, it was out of the way, they weren't bothering anybody. Um, it, you know, it had its downsides to be sure, but there was community there involved and people were taking care of each other. Um, people were taking care of each other more than, than, than they were 
than, than the downsides that people would have you believe. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, somebody got shot there, you know, or we have to shut it down. If we apply that logic to, you know, acts of violence around Seattle, we'd be shutting down great swaths of the city. Um, so what they did as a state of emergency is they shut down the jungle. And by the way, they like oh, nobody remembers this. The day that they shut down, they shut shut down the jungle. They actually like shot a homeless guy dead. The day that they shut down the jungle, they came across a couple of guys having a knife fight. Cop said, "Stop! Drop the knife." The guy didn't drop the knife. It was a little vegetable paring knife. The guy didn't drop the knife. They just shot him down like a dog, dead. Introduced cops in the scene, shut down the jungle, homeless person dies. Um, didn't have to happen, you know? It's like that not recognizing people as being human again. So they shut off the jungle, they fenced it off. Um, since then, they've gone to fence off other areas of the city that were appropriate for homeless people to camp out. Next year, they do the one night count. And guess what happens? Unsheltered homelessness in Fowler quadruples. Unsheltered homelessness in North Seattle quadruples. Suddenly, all of these people are camping out in tents on downtown sidewalks, out at the Ballard Library. Everybody's freaking the fuck out, going, we're putting all this money into homelessness and it's just getting worse. And it's getting worse because the city has like basically given themselves this great big self-inflicted wound by shutting down the out-of-the-way places where people used to be able to camp and have that community and forcing them out into the open where they're in people's way and creating problems for folks. And then with the last budget, you know, I mean, I talked a little bit about my views of cops and homelessness. Um, but in the last budget, they like added seven more cops to the navigation team. And I've seen how this operates. I mean, the navigation team shows up and there's like five cops that show up with the navigation team. They basically just kind of stand around because there isn't that much for them to do. And they've got like all these tasers and shit strapped to them, you know? They're like fully RoboCop hardwared up. And they think that this is like the friendly base of homeless outreach, you know? And, and, and then they just, you know, what they've done with these cops is they've been able to accelerate the rate at which they churn these encampments you know, and, and focusing on parks and sidewalk obstructions and chasing people around at a greater rate. And since they're in parks and sidewalks, they don't have to give them a warning anymore. Uh, they get a half hour if they're there. And then their stuff gets tossed. And they have to, like, go find somewhere else, you know. And, and you know, someone's on the, st on the street and a NAV2 team, this is sort of cop-enhanced navigation team, shows up and, you know, gives them a half hour um, and, and tosses their stuff or doesn't, but they've got to move, you know. These people aren't accepting offers that they've already been made and refused in the past because they're not appropriate for them. They are either coming back to the same place or they're coming back to somewhere nearby. And it's this huge waste of resources that just adds stress to homeless people's lives on the street. Um, I was going to talk more about the auditor's report, but the auditor's report um, really, really questions the use of police on the navigation team. So far, the mayor is utterly ignoring that because the mayor ignores everybody. Um, <laughs> but, the auditor's report is an opening for organizing around this issue to look critically at how the navigation team is operating, how we're approaching unsheltered homelessness, and what we might do differently. So with that, I will finally shut up. And what questions do you have? The sanctioned homeless encampments need volunteers, they need resources, that's a way to engage really directly. My favorite at this point, I mean, you know, they're all pretty cool, and I shouldn't pick favorites, but my favorite is Camp Second Chance, mm -hmm. because it is just such a stunning example of community 
the leadership there is phenomenal. They're really about engaging people. They're really about engaging the community. That's one of the most amazing things about Second Chance is how they've been able to pull the surrounding community into supporting them and really bring them into it and create conversations about homelessness. And that's really, really powerful. That's where people's perceptions really change. You know, and, and that's another thing about the sanctioning conference that I think is underappreciated and that the city doesn't run with it as an asset in the way that they could, is that they are just this stunning means of engaging the broader community in the conversation about homelessness and creating that kind of proximity that really changes people's perceptions about who homeless people are and what they're about. Um, so, you know, if I were, you know, making a decision about what sort of thing to support and put my energy into, that's that's what I would recommend. Yeah. What policies do you think the city should incorporate to help with this? Yeah. Um, I think that I'll, I'll say three things. Mm -hmm. I'll say three things. Um, one is that the city needs to recognize that their current approach to unsheltered homelessness is doing more harm than good. They need to recognize that. They need to back off of their current strategy. That is not going to be easy. But, you know, anybody who is doing this work you know, I mean, even people on the NAV team, they can't be honest about what they see because they'll get fired. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they know. They know that they are doing more harm than good in a lot of cases and pushing people around in the city. And that's, that's a bad solution and that it needs to stop. Um, and the level of police engagement is just stupid, you know. I mean, that's a primary recommendation from the auditor going to hear more about that. That needs to change. Another is the approach to public bathrooms. This gives me an opportunity to talk about something that is in the auditor's report that really, really struck me. You know, at this point, Seattle has six city-funded public bathrooms. And when the auditor looked at them, Four of them were compromised in some way that you limited their usability. And uh, the two that weren't were the ones that are at Green Lake that middle class people use. So that sort of tells you something about the priorities there. Seattle has been ridiculous on public bathrooms. You know, I just wrote a column on, on this, you know, back in 2004, we had this flame with high-tech automated toilets. We spent $5 million for five of these things. They wound up selling on eBay to a racetrack owner for $12,500 four years later after the city backed off on them to say that they were a bad idea. Then they started talking about the damn Portland Loo, you know, this sort of revolutionary architectural approach to toilets that, that you know, kind of deals with some of the downsides that they had with their million dollar toilets. And they only cost like 250, 300,000 each. So that was like a real cost savings, you know. And, and uh, they started talking seven years ago, seven years ago about putting a Portland Loo in Pioneer Square. I think it was six years ago. Um, and the, after like five years of talking about it, they gave up on it because they were still so like PTSD over the four, $5 million bathroom debacle. Um, and after like seven years of discussion this summer, one Portland Loo might be coming to the Ballard Commons, but I wouldn't hold my breath. The, the, if you were to apply, the, this, the auditor's report says that if you were to apply the UN refugee standards of one toilet for every 20 people, that we would need 224 public toilets in Seattle to meet the needs. Well, we have six, 
and four of them don't work the way that they're supposed to. There's a program that the auditor really likes called Mobile Pit Stops in San Francisco that is just brilliant. Um, where they have this like, it's like a, it kind of looks like a tiny house, um, like a double wide tiny house. Um, and it's mounted on a trailer so that you can like move them around. These things cost like 70, I think it's 86 grand each to buy these things. They staff them with people who have employment challenges, so they're staffed and they create jobs for almost poor people as part of that. San Francisco, four years ago, started out with three of them because middle school students were complaining about having to like navigate human feces on their way to school. So they started out with like three of these things as a, as a kind of an experiment. And since then, um, in the last four years, they've expanded to 25 of them in 12 different neighborhoods. Um, Seattle could buy the, uh, could it pay the upfront costs for 10 mobile pit stops and the like $200,000 grant that you need to service them. They could like buy all of that for about a million bucks and staff them for less than a million bucks annually and have this solution to the problem of public waste. I mean, it's a real problem um, that is mobile, that is able to respond to community needs, um, they have like an attendant, they have soap, they have towels, they have good lighting, you know, they have dignity. Um, and we should do something like that. Yeah, maybe is one more that, question. Is that like um, what Union Gospel Mission has? They have a shower. They have a mobile shower. shower. They have a mobile shower. There's another group in Australia that I really love. I forget what they're called. I think they're called like orange chairs, something like that. What is it? Orange Sky. Orange Sky. And they have mobile showers. And not only do they have mobile showers, this is their sort of brilliant innovation. It's mobile shower and laundry. Um, so, you know, and again, it's mobile, so it can go to where the need is, you know, service authorized encampments, unauthorized encampments, you know, meet people where they're at. And they have volunteers that are hooked up with it. They have these orange chairs that you have on the sidewalk. And volunteers sit in them. And while people are waiting to like take a shower or waiting for their laundry to get done, volunteers like talk to them. You know, it like offers that community, gets people involved, recognizes them as human beings. Um, the two different things in particular that I, I heard um, that I wanted want to ask you about the first is that um, you said that there is a, is a that uh, the homelessness response systems isn't capable of handling the the problem at the scale that is right now, and you talk, mentioned about the. Um, I guess the you know, people in this court, of course, of how we're financing homelessness. I was wondering if, if um, you're suggesting that the problem, part of the problem with um, with, a, with our our previous ability to address homelessness is a fiscal problem. Oh, definitely. Definitely, it's a tax problem. It's a tax problem. I mean, radical inequality in, about, in America is about unfair taxation, pure and simple. Underfunded infrastructure, underfunded human services, why everything's falling apart, um, why people's basic human needs aren't getting met, why we keep you know, putting the screws to the poor and pretending that they're the problem while we give tax breaks to rich people. I mean, that's, that's, that's you know, the core issue. Um, fundamentally, it is a problem of resources and it's a problem of taxation. You know, I mean, the head tax, it was flawed. 
Um, and in many ways, it was not the most brilliant piece of legislation that ever came down the pike, or the most well thought out piece of legislation that ever came down the pike. But it did get at that, you know, we have people who are really profiting and benefiting from this lopsided economy, and they need to pay more to be part of the solution thing going for it. Um, and, you know, I think um, to make meaningful headway on this sort of imbalance of public resources that are brought to the issue, and it's not just the public resources to solve homelessness. I mean, you can quantify that, and it has been. There's the McKenzie report, there was another report that the Vulcan Foundation done, and they were able to put like dollar figures to, you know, if you were going to build all of the housing in King County that you needed, it would be $400 million or $600 million. You can quantify that. You can quantify what we would need in terms of emergency shelter, but that's, that's the symptom. That's not the problem. I mean, the, the, the problem is that we've had, you know, more than four decades of attacks on the human services social safety net. You know, we've had decades of, of bad tax policy that, you know, pumps up the military economy and, and, and gives the rich and corporations tax breaks. We've had this radical widening of inequality. You know, and, and if we want to fix homelessness, we got to fix that crap. Um, we <clears throat> talked about a lot of good things tonight. Um, I think the continuum of care was a was a very good, uh, important thing to mention because you just don't go from homelessness to having a home like that. Um, the uh, there's a lot of good examples overseas of solving um, the homeless challenge. Yeah. Um, if if you can you talk about the the pit stops or the mobile uh, restrooms? And I know Union Gospel Mission. I think someone mentioned that before. It goes out and does that. Um, if if you if you had the power to employ <coughs> three policies that either. Uh, uh, if you have the power to employ three policies that can make an immediate impact based upon what you've experienced and what you've seen, um, what would they be? Mm. That's a really, are we talking like locally here? In, I mean, you're just thinking about the, the thinking low, about hanging, yeah, like, like, low hanging fruit, where would you start? Because, uh, I mean, for example, in Singapore, they have subsidized low income housing. I mean, lots of it. And it's very successful. Yeah. Um, and Singapore is a beautiful city. Right. Um, why, you know, so it's, so it's, you know, what are the three policies? What is the greatest hurdle here in Seattle? Other than you mentioned taxation, inequality, you know, that's okay. preventing us from, from, from finding a solution. So it's, there's multiple questions in there. So I'll start with something that's actually politically real, which is eviction reform. Um, it's a shameful situation, it's an exploitative situation, it's predatory, it is about setting up poor people to fail and then fucking them. You know, we need eviction reform. There is real political possibility for doing that both on the state, city and the state level right now. I and mean, people often ask me whether, whether rent reform or, or uh, rent, uh, blanking, control. rent control, thank you, whether rent control is the solution. And it's like, well, yeah, that would be helpful if it were politically possible, you know? I mean, it's where, where, where they cut us off on the state level from that being a viable political solution, and that's um, the politics of that make it impossible to change. But we've got, we've got, real possibility for eviction reform. So, right that, one. so that would be number number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think, and I'm thinking about, you know, the people 
The people that I really care about, you know, the people that are on the street, the people who are sleeping out, the people who are getting screwed, the people who are getting chased around, um, whose lives that we're actively making worse. What would make a real difference to them would be to decriminalize our city's response to that. Just because we're not arresting them doesn't mean we're not criminalizing them. It's a very criminalizing approach that we're taking that is very intimidating and cop heavy. Um, and so, you know, this would go, I'm gonna cheat here and combine this mm -hmm. with a harm reduction zone policy. I think in addition to the uh, sanctioned encampments, you know, which are, you know, part of the solution that is working now, there needs to be more tolerance for unsanctioned encampments and that there needs to be areas where there can be unsanctioned encampments that are out of the way. Um, not forcing people onto downtown sidewalks, into parks, places where they're creating problems and creating political unrest, you know, because people are seeing the optics of things getting worse, and they are getting worse, but they're, they're getting worse because people are being forced out in the open. So roll that decision back, figure out where you're going to allow people to be, and instead of chasing them around and foreclosing the possibility of building any real relationships with them that can lead to change, focus on those like harm reduction zones, that's my name for it, harm reduction zones, um, and provide hygiene services in there, do trash removal, provide sharps containers, mitigate the harm, and send, send teams in there to build relationships with people, take advantage <coughs> of the fact that you're allowing people to be somewhere as the opportunity to build relationships. Um, so I combined two into one there. And I think the third would be to have policy change that allows for the creation of more cheap housing. You know, I mean, we have this idea that everybody needs housing like like my apartment looks like, you know? And that's just not the case. I mean, people are happy as hell to get into a tiny house, you know? And that's like, a, that's an eight by 10 room that has a light and a door that locks and, and some heat, you know? And, and that, I think of those, there used to be this form of housing um, in the sort of first wave of mass homelessness. This isn't the first time we've had mass homelessness. We had mass homelessness in the United States from like the late 1800s up until World War II. You know, and it was this, it started, started with the, um, it was, it was the convergence of civil war demobilization and the imposition of the factory labor system. They kind of inverted the relationship between the urban and the rural and just created mass dispossession. And these like sort of skid road areas sort of developed as a market response to that. They developed housing um, at various levels. Well now housing has been thoroughly commodified. You can't make enough money providing housing to poor people. So we don't have those kinds of market responses to, to the demand for poor people's housing because there just isn't enough money in it. But when that was going on, the form of housing that was most popular was the cage hotel. And the Cage Hotel, you couldn't do it now because it would be a code abomination, you know. But the Cage Hotel was basically cubicles on a factory warehouse floor, you know, that had chicken wire on the bottom for ventilation and chicken wire across the top for ventilation. They were just big enough to have like a bed and a trunk in it. It had a locking door. And it existed, they were, they were the moment they talked to people and they surveyed people what their favorite form of housing was. It was the Cage Hotel. 
because it existed at that intersection of minimal cost, maximum personal freedom and privacy. And I think that that's kind of what the tiny houses are right now. I think tiny houses are the modern cage hotel. Um, but, you know, getting at that bigger question of how do we produce more housing cheaply that is good enough? 